Welcome everyone uh, to the first session of our graduate communication series for spring 2016. It is my um, absolute pleasure to introduce my colleague, Professor Michael Laramie, who will be talking to us today about cultural stereotypes. Uh, Professor Laramie's expertise, uh, specifically which came out of his dissertation work, looks at um, the film industry in Nigeria, and I'm sure you'll have many great stories to tell us about uh, what it was like being in Nigeria and interviewing film directors um, over there. Um, his, again, his interest is in film studies, and he has been teaching film and mass media courses at La Salle for the last six years. Uh, Professor Laramie has also and continues to do work with uh, La Salle Village and teaches uh, smaller, shorter courses um, over there. And recently he has turned some of his work from his dissertation into a book chapter, which was uh, published recently. Not yet. On its way? They are very slow. <laughs> but it's submitted. Yeah. Okay. It's accepted. It's accepted and submitted. So on its way for publication. So thank you again so much for uh, being with us today. Thank you. <clears throat> we should also give an even louder round of applause for Dr. Jean Beck for organizing this communication series and her tireless efforts at keeping this you know, very good opportunity for all you international and graduate students afloat. So that <laughs> so there's two main cultural stereotypes I want to talk about today. One would be Arab Americans or Arabs in general, and generally film, but film and TV, as you see a lot of crossover between the two. And the others would be images of Africa. And again, in film and TV. But, well, I'll begin with <clears throat> just a general you know, introduction and discussion about why you watch film. Why do you watch film? Why do you watch film? For education. All right. Well, that's not usually the first first uh, answer for people. Education. It's different stories, different life experiences. Okay, that sounds educational as well. Uh, but the storytelling aspect and creative storytelling, so when people talk about stories, do you feel like you get sucked into the story? Yes. And that's a good thing, right? And someone would say that that could have an escapist component to it because you might escape your everyday troubles and enter into the world of the film. You get sucked in sometimes literally and identify with someone who's on screen because they're like you, maybe you want to be like them, uh, maybe they're not like you and they're just fascinating to watch. And that would be, you know, a reason for watching being escapism. Entertainment, I would think, would be the first answer for most people. Uh, entertainment. Is that an op a reason that you would watch films typically? But education's above that. Um, it comes first, but yes, I agree. It comes to your mind first, yeah. that's good. All right, education, entertainment. But primarily, entertainment and escapism would be the first two main reasons people talk about watching Hollywood films. Uh, education being a third one, and for informative purposes. And in those cases, what would you typically, what type of film would you typically gravitate towards or choose to watch if you wanted to be informed and or educated? What type of film do you think you'd watch? Documentary. Yeah. You all agree? You've heard this before? <laughs> Do documentary is intended to be informational. Right? Um, and a lot of the work that I would do would talk about why do we watch certain films, and if we ask someone who wants to learn from film, um, then is that film a good source to learn from? Can it have misinformation? Will it have information? Is it slanted? or biased in, in any way, shape, or form. And ultimately, when you break it down, most films are biased. Uh, but still, you know, today we're going to mainly focus on watching films for educational purposes and talk about films' ability to inform, misinform, and especially when dealing with cultural and cross-cultural representations. What's the weight and what's the effect of that? So we'll move on to. This is very, very early films from Hollywood. Have you ever heard of The Sheik or The Thief of Baghdad? 
probably not on your Netflix queue. Uh, but The Sheik was a film from 1921 starring Rudolph Valentino, The Thief of Baghdad, a film from three years later in 1924 starring Douglas Fairbanks. They were both two of the most influential filmmaker, oh, sorry, film actors of all time. How are you doing? And both of them had an extreme effect on audiences. Uh, Douglas Fairbanks was thought of as, as one of the you know, most well-known and hi highest paid actors in early Hollywood. And Rudolph Valentino is well known for his dramatic good looks, making women all over the world you know, large fans of his. But they had a, a massive effect. And you know, film itself was invented in 1895, which is basically the same month that Jim, Ro Jim Crow laws were instated in the United States, which means that segregation would now be a law, separate but equal quarters for blacks and whites. So the films that you saw from 1895, from the early 1900s on to 1924, 1921, were all highly, highly you know, racist films. They dealt with um, issues of, of culture and cross-cultural representation in very insensitive ways. And these were two of the earliest landmarks that misrepresented Arabs and Arab Americans. We'll talk a little bit more about what those misrepresentations were. But this is one clearly here. Now, Disney is something that's going to be the focus of a small clip I show you. Uh, but this is clearly another misrepresentation. The first one with the sheik, the sheik being someone who's wealthy, uh, someone who often is abusive or oppressive to women. And in another case here, you have a, you know, a Disney barbarian. And these images of a savage, uncivilized world that in a lot of ways, people from the United States were not familiar with, so they exoticized it. And a famous book by a scholar, Edward Said, and his, his last name is spelled S-A-I-D, I'm sure you may have heard of him, but his book is called Orientalism. And it really you know, looks at a lot of different Asian cultures and Middle Eastern cultures and how they're exoticized in common popular TV and common uh, you know, Hollywood films. And not just in, in the United States, but in Europe as well, these, these trends were going on. But largely focusing at the United States and how they've mis misrepresented all sorts of different Asian cultures uh, and blended them into stereotypes that would then potentially misinform viewers and lead American audiences, at the very least, to thinking that this is a, an exotic land that we don't understand, and it's in many ways frightening. Uh, and they don't really go beyond that to do some serious research and then expose that and show that in the films. It's more about just you know dealing with these surface-level stereotypes. This one being much more familiar and much more contemporary uh, for violence and terrorism. And Saeed, do you see many images that of Arab Americans or Arabs in general that are not <clears throat> dealing with violence and terrorism today? You do, do you see the non-stereotypical images? Sometimes. Sometimes, all right. Think about that, chew on it for a minute, because I want to know what examples you would have that are non-stereotypical, because I'm sure you'd have a better eye for those types of things. But uh, it's hard to think of them offhand, and even doing a you know, general search today to look for non-stereotypical or positive images of Arabs. And almost nothing comes out. It's, it's really dealing with negative images and how to combat them, but without the presence of positive images. Another one that's just images of threatening males. Now, what are the images of, stereotypical images of females? Arab, Arab American females or Arab females that we see. Let me think. Historically, the harem. Okay. Right. So, sexual object, basically, uh, for men who have their way with many, many different women. The right. harem. Uh, and, you know, maidens, uh, the innocent and pure, again, for sexual reasons. Um, one that's a little more exoticized, sometimes you see belly dancers. Right. Uh, there was, a, I believe, a chapter in a book about Arab stereotypes that was called, I can't remember the first, but it was 
bombers. Belly dancers, billionaires. Billionaires, yes. Billionaires, belly dancers, and bombers are the three com most, maybe most common. The sheik being sort of an early form of that billionaire. The belly dancers and bombers we see here, these threatening things. And then in terms of othering, again, something that Edward Said dealt with significantly, and by no means are Arab Americans uh, the only ones who've been othered. You have several different Asian cultures that are always othered. You know, don't get diverse representations of Chinese and Thai and Vietnamese. It's all sort of bottled together, common like the Native American is often. But in this classic film, thought of as you know one of the highest grossing, one of the most widely seen American films from the 80s, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. And you see him as this staunchly male, uh, heterosexual, is very in control of his environment here, even though it's in a world that's completely uh, unknown to him, in an exotic world where everywhere he turns, he's faced with mortal danger, um, but always overcomes it because he's either much smarter or much stronger, just much more savvy than any of his Arab um, enemies. Right? And they are clearly painted as enemies. You have a hero, and this is not for every film, uh, but for this film, certainly, you had a clear, clear cut good and bad. And Indiana Jones was on one side, and uh, you have Arabs and Germans, and a host of whole other cultures thought of as the enemies historically. So, how do you break down these stereotypes? One is this clip from this film, Real Bad Arabs, I'd like to show you, which is sort of a summary with lots of interesting images and a montage of negative images. Have you seen the film before? So you, you, no, you've heard of it? Yeah. Well, real, R-E-E-L, meaning the film real. So these are, when they say real bad Arabs, not to mean that they're real, you know, they're the bad in actuality, they're just that they're portrayed bad on film. So we'll hope this opens. Feel a spark of emotion light up every inch of you. Feel warm inside. Feel our big, beautiful candle. Feel blade. S.C. Johnson. Sup Jolly made this film. Did he teach at University of Miami? basically as subhumans, intervention, a term used by Nazis to vilify gypsies and Jews. These images have been with us for more than a century. Just 
2006. And what I try to do is to make visible what too many of us seem not to see. A dangerously consistent pattern of hateful Arab stereotypes. Stereotypes that rob an entire people of their humanity. All aspects of our culture project the Arab as villain. That is a given. There is no deviation. We have taken a few structured images and repeated them over and over again. Hostages of the how you feel about it. Whether one lives in Paducah, Kentucky, or Wood River, Illinois, we know basically the same thing. Listen to the sound, Jesus. Mythology, the mythology, namely Hollywood's images of Arabs. We inherited the Arab image primarily from Europeans in, in the early days, you know, maybe 150 years, 200 years ago. The British and the French who traveled to the Middle East, and those who didn't travel to the Middle East, conjured up these images of Arab as the Orient's other the travel writers, the artists who fabricated these images and were very successful as a matter of fact. And these images were transmitted and inherited by us. We took them, we embellished them, and here they are. When you cross the mountains up the Munich to our country, Mr. Turo, you will be stepping back 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. Look at the mountains. We have this fictional setting called Arabland, a mythical theme park. And in Arabland, you know, you have the ominous music, you have the desert. We start with the desert, always the desert as a threatening place. We add an oasis, palm trees, a palace that has a torture chamber in the basement. The Pasha sits there on his few you know, posh cushions with harem maidens surrounding him. None of the harem maidens please him, so they abduct the blonde heroine from the West who doesn't want to be seduced. When we visit Arabland, we must be aware of the instant Alibaba kit. What we have, we have the property masters of Hollywood going around and they're cladding the women in see-through pantaloons, belly dancing outfits, they're giving the Arab villains scimitars, you know, these long, long scimitars. We see people riding around on magic carpets, turban charmers, programming snakes in and out of baskets. Yesteryear's Arab land is today's Arab land. You are late. A thousand apologies, a patient one. You had it then. I had to slit a few throats, but I got it. Disney's Aladdin is seen by millions of children worldwide. It was hailed as one of Disney's finest accomplishments. But the film recycled every old degrading stereotype from Hollywood's silent black and white past. And over and over again, the portrait is inept. 
So, in a movie like True Lies, not only are the Arabs dangerous, they're also incompetent. I we are all prepared to die. One turn of that key, two million of your people will die instantly. That key, that key! Who's taking the key? One actor who excels in this portrayal of Arabs as buffoons is Jamie Farr in Cannonball Run 2. I have a weakness for blondes. They will be here without more statues. All the stereotypes are here. Too rich and stupid to know the value of money. Give me one sweet. Better yet, give my four. And of course, he's oversexed, lecherous, uncontrollably obsessed with the American woman. Here, my desert blossom. Give the change. Have you ever considered joining a harem? And so another pattern is the lecherous Arab. In Jewel of the Nile, Sheikh Omar tricks Kathleen Turner. How? He convinces her to come with him to Arab land. Then he imprisons her. You stay here and you write what I tell you to write. We see the same sort of ominous seduction and protocol. The entire plot revolves around an Arab emir's infatuation with the blonde, blue-eyed Goldie Hawn. In the Bond film, Never Say Never Again, Kim Basinger is abused by the most sleazy-looking Arabs imaginable. She's tied to a pole, stripped to her underwear, and auctioned off to primitive-looking Bedouins. And in Sahara, Brooke Shields is also kidnapped and presented to the lecherous Arab sheikh for his own perverted pleasure. Get away from me, buddy! More than 300 movies. Nearly 25% of all Hollywood movies that in one way or another demean Arabs contain gratuitous slurs or they portray Arabs as being the butt of a cheap joke. We were going to the Mecca City and the plane is full of Arabs with these animals. Goat, sheep, chickens. I mean, they don't go anywhere without their goddamn animals. We had to put plastic in the cabins. You know, you and they, they defecate. We have films by Neil Simon, like Chapter 2, the beginning of the film. The protagonist arrives back from London, and, and his brother says, How is London? And he says, Full of Arabs. How is London? Full of Arabs. Well, imagine if he had said, Full of blacks, full of Jews, full of Hispanics. I mean, that's ridiculous. Why do we do these things? One of the most offensive films with the gratuitous images, Father of the Bride 2. It features Steve Martin selling his house to a Mr. Habib. Very much. When you can move out. Excuse me? The Habibs would like to buy the house, George. It's exactly what they've been looking for. Yes, when you can move. We need house a week from Wednesday. And my wife wants flour dishes in kitchen. You said we pay top dollar. When Habib's submissive wife tries to speak, he shouts gibberish at her. <laughs> and then he offers Martin a fifteen thousand dollar cash bonus to move out in ten days. When Martin tells Mr. Habib that he doesn't want to sell the house after all, he finds Habib's wrecking crew there, ready to demolish his beautiful home. <laughs> and in a scene that calls to mind one of the most degrading stereotypes of the Jewish people, Mr. Habib demands an extra $100,000 to sell the house that he has owned for just a day back to Mark. You want me to take out a loan on something I owned free and clear just 24 hours ago? Well, yeah, that is up to you, Judge. Your path, your defense, your memories. Now, if you look at the other Father of the Bride films, this with Taylor, Spencer, Tracy, there were no Arabs or Arab Americans. So why does Disney inject these horrific, sort of offensive characters in Father of the Bride, part two? It's the same reason that in Gladiator, the slave traders who kidnap Russell Crowe and bring him back to Rome are Arabs. I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, why does Hollywood inject Arabs, scenes of Arabs, and or slurs demeaning Arabs, and movies having nothing to do with the Middle East. So you're sitting like I am, for example, watching Back to the Future, about a mad scientist. 
And yet, early on in the film, we see these ugly, inept Libyans with machine guns in a parking lot trying to gun down the protagonist. <coughs> I won. This movie wasn't about the future. It was the same old stereotyping from the past. And the same goes for Hollywood's view of Arab women. The Arab woman today is bright, intelligent. She's someone that, 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 who is exceeding in all professions. And yet this reality still is being denied us on silver screens. The highly sexualized belly dancer has been with us from the beginning of Hollywood's history. In spot. <clears throat> Just circling back to what we were talking about there. So that's one film made in 2006, 10 years ago now, that tries to shed light on historically just what has happened in terms of the representation of Arab characters in Hollywood. And then also, it gives you many examples, but since then, so in some of the last 10 years, or in any time period, let me go back to that question earlier, say, what, what representations do you see in Hollywood films or on TV that are positive or not stereotypical? I would say like, they give like, bad Do you see you see a lessening of the stereotypes? Some to, any any particular examples coming to mind? No. What about anyone else? Do you see? So a lot of the film scholars will talk about how film has been used to oppress others, oppress other peoples. You had images of Arabs that are negative, images of Hispanics, as you mentioned all these different groups, and specifically in terms of my research, uh, Africans colonized by several different countries, misrepresented in several different cultures, cultures media. Uh, so in this case, this is gonna be about you know, Iranian culture and trying to stop those stereotypes before they're created with a film that's targeted towards kids. Uh, actually, it's a cartoon. But this is the discussion, you'll see a clip from the cartoon and a discussion related to how this would help break down these stereotypes. Why wouldn't they? TV, movies, the internet, and what they absorb from you, shaping their minds and how they feel about others, maybe forever. Kid Savvy Film Company is out with an animated tale that doesn't try to break down cultural barriers. It wants them never to be filmed. You're seeing it's also not going. Susan, Saman, welcome to America. These are not bad cartoons that most of us grew up watching on television. Bobak and Friends at First Norwoods is a new animated cartoon created to teach children about the Iranian culture, when much of the adult world's attention is on Iran's nuclear program and the government's hardline rhetoric. And we felt that it was a really good time to be doing this sort of um, use of technology to bring to children as well as parents more knowledge, more power about cultures that may be misunderstood. The cartoon depicts the richness and beauty of an ancient land and the New Year holiday in which Iran is called Nowruz. The central character is Babak, a seven-year-old Iranian boy adapted to life in America and torn between the cultures of his homeland and his new home in the new world. Hey Bobby, what are you going to be doing for Easter? <sighs> I don't celebrate Easter. What? Why not? Because I'm Iranian. We don't celebrate Easter. Wow. First no Christmas, now this. Wow. It must stink to be you. Through so interaction with his relatives who have just arrived from Iran, Babak learns more and more about his Iranian customs. With the help of two fairy tale figures, Babak finally connects to his Iranian heritage when he has a dream that takes him to the heart of what was once the Persian Empire. They're the Persian Empire? Yes. One of the greatest empires of the ancient world. It stretched from Greece to India. Wow! I didn't know you were such a great empire in the past. The cartoon is the work of a U.S.-based production company. 
founded by four young entrepreneurs. We really want this um, an enterprise to be something that's going to teach diversity through cartoons, not just about the Persian culture, but about other cultures that are really in the news today and where children are suffering from in the school, in the school yards and, and back at home. And the creators believe there will be less suffering if there is more acceptance, tolerance, and appreciation of different cultures. Their next project focuses on South Korean and Arab heritage. Uh, take it. You, you have the Iranian American culture, right? It was all to your family. Your kids must love this. They love it. And they love it. It's like how the DVD has stuff. So that being one possible example, another <clears throat> U.S. educational initiative to try and teach kids from very early on not to create the stereotypes by talking about the richness of different cultures. And that they really do differentiate by focusing on Iranian or Persian culture here and then saying they're doing another one uh, based on Arab culture. So some people would conflate Persian and Arab together as well. And, and just lots of you know very specific details uh, for a project like this. But do you think that this would be a helpful way to help combat stereotypes of Iranian uh, you know, culture and Iranian as terrorist in the United States. Would this be a helpful way? Do you agree, Jill? I think so. What do you think? Possibly? I hope. You hope? Because um, for me in my country. And where are you like from again? Thailand. Right. I, um, if we say Arab, definitely help you know, encourage the creation or of whatever stereotype they believe. Uh, media could also enforce that. Uh, it would be good to have them working you know, in, in tandem to help combat that stereotype. And then friends and socialization process could introduce more stereotypes, but if those friends were also taught by parents who are educating them in this way, perhaps it could potentially slow down. It might seem idealistic and, and hopeful, but if there were more productions like this and a lot less of the stereotypical productions we saw in the first film, uh, it's likely that that change could you know, pick up a bit that uh, could become more of a realistic goal. You know, interestingly, um, in Northern Ireland, there were a group of professors of psychology who did a longitudinal study of groups of children uh, ages four and five that were from two different communities, the Catholic community and the Protestant community. Even though they were all Irish living in Ireland, there was identification with their religious backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And what they wanted to see if they could find out is what is the source of the stereotypes that the Catholics had of the Protestants and vice versa. And is, is it present at this very early age? And what they discovered is that the children modeled the behavior and attitudes of the parents in the home. And the children learned to hate before they were six. And they always learned to identify with their own religious background, even though they had the same ethnic background right. as the other group, and look at the other religious group as the other or the enemy. They weren't born this way, they were taught. Right. And uh, interesting, I don't know if media usage, you know, introduced at a young age, can reverse the family or stop, biases, right. you know, the influence of the parents because that's where they're learning. Most likely and unfortunately, that 
that show probably would be shown in a, in a household, you would think, where the parents were already less biased. If they were facilitating that, if they just wanted upon it on their own, it, it, who knows, the family could have been from any, uh, you know, any persuasion. So one thing about, I've watched this clip a number of times, but I never thought about it this way. The, it's really, the content is relatively complex because it's not only about the stereotypes, it's also about the identity of being right. a child of yeah. immigrants right. and the confrontation with other school They say, right. oh, first no Christmas, right. then no Easter, that sucks. And then it also has a historical aspect where it's talking about the history of um, Iran. So it's a relatively com complex yeah. narrative. It, it um, is. Yeah, it is. It seems like a very impressive initiative. Mm -hmm. We will always debate whether the effects, you know, would be really felt, or you know, with, with like you mentioned with the family, will they, uh, will, will family have more of an influence than media, and vice versa? Obviously, there's always going to be working together. Right. Right. But it's, uh, it is an interesting program, and yes, certainly yeah. a worthy initiative. That it would be do great like if they show. could do it for other, not just yeah. Iranian. I've never I seen any of the other ones. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I searched once, once, but I couldn't find it. So it may have not taken off. Yeah, because there's no funding for right, something right. like that, uh, of course. Right, but this was self, I believe this was self financed by the four women, but then beyond that, obviously, you need funding because right. it costs money. It would be nice if they could find uh, mm -hmm. you know, someone who could foundation who would support them in what they do, or the private donor. Um, the other piece of this, I know you're talking about No, no, no. But um, in terms of television, the, the children here in the United States grow up with Sesame Street. And I know that Sesame Street has been adapted in Israel um, for the Israeli children. And, and of course, that was supported by PBS, and it was supported by a number of foundations. I, that would be another venue, it maybe, is, yeah. and I'm just curious. I don't think from any anything I've read or anything I know, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist, that they have had a Sesame Street created for any of the Arab countries. We've, so, had, we've had it, does, actually. Does it exist? It does exist. I don't have a lot of memory of it, because that was many years ago, but you're just making me think <coughs> we do have... Um, I don't know how it got created, if it got... Did you watch it growing up? No. So maybe it wasn't by the time... You're obviously younger than me, so by the time <laughs> <laughs> you started watching TV, maybe it's no longer on TV, but I grew up watching it. Um, it's called Iftah, yeah, Simpson, Simpson for... Yeah, I know this. Yeah. yeah. So that's another way, maybe, to combat mm -hmm. some of these stereotypes and to help children understand you know, the differences. Yeah. With the, when I show this often in class, uh, the Babakan Friends is another Sesame Street clip I do show with it. And it's from American Sesame Street, but they show a glimpse into the <clears throat> life of a Mexican family and how the family every morning will have to go out and milk the cows and produce everything very fresh and bake their bread. And it's sort of a very collectivist look at um, you know, daily life growing up in Mexico. So it, it had an eye towards other cultures and how people might grow up differently and act differently with their families, but it wasn't a whole show or program, you know, devoted or adapted to to Mexican culture and language. It was but still I, in English. I think the challenge, though, to me is for people, it's in in a by trying to educate, it's reinforcing. So if you are if they're literally showing a clip of a Mexican family going out to milk a cow, that's just that is reinforcing a stereotype yeah. that they are not as developed, not as... Right, right, yeah. But I think it's hard. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna get into that a little bit now, talking about Nigeria. <coughs> but think about, well, we talked about Arab stereotypes, but while I'm talking about this, think about any stereotypes you see of Thai culture, either you know, in, in the United States media or of Chinese culture in the United States media. Uh, but then also we could think about, as, as we're talking about this, uh, what groups are stereotyped within your own culture's media? So when you were in Thailand, were there different stereotypes, not necessarily of Americans, but of certain 
groups within Thai culture, certain groups within Saudi culture or Chinese culture that are stereotyped in your own in your own country's media. So think about that a little bit. You can you don't have to answer right now, but afterwards we can we can discuss it. But the syndrome. Uh, so studying African film is something <clears throat> that I got into initially because it seemed like there wasn't enough people studying it and those who were studying it had very specific views about how everything should be studied and placed and there was just lots of gaps for more research. One of the areas that was under research was Nigerian film, right? Nollywood they call it, right? which is one sort of one of those areas where the name um, is much debated uh, in terms of its you know, political leanings. Uh, if they want to have this unique industry in and of themselves, which is the third largest in the world in terms of uh, the money made and the films produced, uh, why would they use a, f a term like Nollywood that just makes it seem like they're trying to remake Hollywood films? Same way, you know, ba Bollywood in India, uh, which is in Mumbai, but at one point was not called Mumbai, it was called Bombay, and so you get the term Bollywood. So Nigerian films were thought to be low grade, low budget, lots of scholars would call them trashy, garbage, not worth watching, it was basically the trend. And these would be some Nigerian scholars, some other African scholars, some white American scholars, white European, black European, Largely everyone, except for a couple people, thought these aren't worth looking at. They're garbage because they're all for entertainment purposes only. And African films historically had been artistic pieces made for social change in a post-colonial um, world that were trying to deal with issues of identity. Films that the film world, the film critic world, loved. Because they saw them in Europe. They saw different forms of them in different European countries. They're made in a style they were used to. Uh, and then Nollywood comes out. Those theaters are destroyed by civil war. They have a straight to video uh, functioning system. That's how people watch the, the films in the early 90s when this industry was beginning. Uh, so it wasn't at all uh, the structure of it, the background of it, wasn't at all like what European films, or previous African films, or Hollywood films are about where you go to the theater and watch it all together, it's more of personal consumption. And the films would be made in a couple weeks sometimes, shoestring budgets of $10,000 with non-professional actors. And a lot of them do admittedly look very amateurish. But when you're making a thousand films a year, you can't disregard them all. all right? But people weren't looking at individual films. They didn't want to research them or watch them. They just didn't want to watch them. Right? They're hard to obtain, first of all. I have some here to pass around. They look different. They feel different. They are different in a lot of ways. All right? You can pass it around as a big chunk all together. This here is a film that was being played at a cinema. So I'm gonna, I'll go into this a little bit. That was meant to attack the situation with orphans, challenge the situation with orphans. In, Niger in Nigeria, the main character is an orphan, and uh, it wants to attack you know, orphanages and, and how orphans are dealt with, how they're treated, and the plight that they have to you know, face on a daily basis. Well, when you think of Africa, you might often think of orphans. That ties into this phrase down here, bad news or no news. That's what most scholars will talk about. That, that's all you hear about. If you want to hear anything about Africa in the news, it's bad news or nothing. Right. So some of the common, oops, common images that you see, uncivilized, this would be rural, exotic African settings, rather than cities. Right. When I visited there, and you'll see several pictures from that, visited cities and rural areas, but you mainly see images of this uncivilized bushman with little, you know, little clothes, spears, homemade weapons, and a sort of warring mentality. You see this image of warlords 
uh, basically run or doing the work of you know, white-owned arms dealers, white-owned uh, traders, uh, museum dealers, uh, people who are uh, fleecing African uh, animals, whatever it is. Uh, they're warlords, they're traders, and they're out for, for no good. Child soldiers and orphans. So you mentioned that would a film like the one I spoke about be enhancing these stereotypes? Um, it's something that does exist in the continent and in Nigeria, and is a, is a major problem and social issue. So making a film about it wouldn't necessarily, you know, only enhance the stereotype uh, because it. It is something that exists. It would be something that would be presenting to you, yes, this is something that exists and is a social issue we need to deal with, but it's not the only thing they make films about. That's right? the point. So, yes, it's not the only thing they make films about. And when you see these other films in here, none of them look like that. Baby Police is a comedy. All right? The Holocaust is, a, is a, basically a you know, dramatic war film. Well, Swofia in London is a film about someone who wants their inheritance from their, from their brother who lives in London, and he goes through a series of miscommunications and is basically uh, being swindled by people there. The opposite. This America is a film where they have interpretations of the United States. When they get there, they find out it's nothing like what they expected. They're Nigerian immigrants. So all these films, very, very different format. Some are entertainment-based. Some are based in social justice, like the film you're looking at right now, Saeed. But it's mainly an entertainment industry. That's why people did not want any part of it in terms of the critics. They didn't feel that it was worthy like the artistic films. And some of the films will deal with issues like this, but most won't. Uh, most won't deal with it. So it's something different. The images of poverty and hunger. Specifically with Nigeria, you hear about the 419er scams. And you get an email that says that there's a bunch of money waiting for you, and if you, all you have to do is give all your contact information, and they have you know one million dollars U.S. and etc. People would fall for those for those scams. That's the main thing you hear about Nigeria. Uh, but then you had issues in the last few years there uh, with terrorists. Being I should go back one. Just another image. I'm not going to lie, there were um, areas where I went in Nigeria, mainly in the city, in Lagos, the biggest city, uh, where you'd go into a you know, internet cafe and there'd be a lot of people in there um, and police you know, watching to make sure that they're not scammers. Sometimes people, you know, I had been, I was asked how to spell certain things, and it did cross my mind that maybe they were sending some sort of email. But that is my conditioning. This is like first couple of days there, sort of the conditioning I had from the media here about what to expect. But mainly, when you know, when I went there, it was all those types of images that I saw: poverty. Uh, that's what you see beforehand. What are the real images of Nigeria? And I'll talk about. You know, the, the real substance of the film industry. But you don't hear about the film industry unless you had me in class, pretty much. Did anyone else ever talk about it, Jill? No? Uh, Langley, anyone ever? Did you, did you hear a lot about Nigerian film? No? Taid, no? Janice, do you? No? <laughs> Oh, no, it's, you're our resident <laughs> Well, I will be going to a, to a conference in Atlanta, and, and there will be people there who know about it, but still, even amongst these film studies scholars, there are going to be a bunch of people in the audience who've never seen a Nigerian film, yet they're the third largest producer of films. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that some of them are made on VCDs, and they're hard to get, and they think there's not a market for it here. But these films are are very diverse and they show lots of different pockets and areas and shapes of Nigeria. Nigeria is broken down into three major ethnicities. In the north you have a Hausa, uh, which is a large portion. They are you know, more uh, Muslim than in the south and they are 
largely stereotyped within Nigerian films as this sort of rural, backwards area of, of Nigeria in the north. And people who were <clears throat> directors who were you know, showing me around the country in different cities even felt uncomfortable if they were from the south in some of these cities. The one we went to is, is called Yola, which is not far away from where um, it's a Christmas Day shoe bomber years and years ago was found. And, and there's been uh, you know, kidnappings there, and recently a lot of association with terrorists there. So there's a general discomfort and dislike for that area amongst Nigerians. And you know, that that's became the narrative of what's going on in Nigeria in terms of uh, in American media was, was that it was now an area where terrorists were, were, were safe. And that there wasn't a lot of regulation. It was easy for them to operate there. And what about all of the problems that they had uh, with some of the Christians being persecuted by yeah. some well, of these terrorists? So the, the north is all Islamic. And that's where the Christians you know, would be pushed out of areas, uh, largely in, in those sections. Uh, small villages where people were either Christian or if they were you know, practicing animistic religions or polytheistic religions, they'd be uh, persecuted by Islamic fundamentalists. Um, that's not uncommon across, across Africa, unfortunately. Um, you know, the same situation led to the refugees from Sudan years ago, uh, the, the lost boys of Sudan, the Sudanese refugees. But <clears throat> there's just a lot of negative news. Uh, and when I went there, I expected uh, that people would be worried about me because all they hear about is, is negative things. I went there, and you know, part of my mission of going there was to find out what. Now, obviously, you need to do research on the film industry and talk to directors, but also find out what it's really like for me. So I could come back and tell people, you know, Nigeria isn't, or maybe it is, and we'll find out. But it's some of the things they say about it are true, but there's just so much more to that narrative that's left out, uh, largely because the people in power who are making these images don't care to know the real deal about what's going on there. Uh, they, they, or they just find it much easier uh, in terms of ratings to show these familiar images, familiar images of poverty and uh, you know, orphans and religious and political conflict and of course you know, uncivilized, impoverished, <clears throat> generally villages, not really cities. But some of the real images that people need to see that could be part of the discussion and are part of some of these films, and I'll show you a clip, but just by football I mean soccer. Okay. But there it's, it's football, <coughs> right? It's state-of-the-art, beautiful football stadiums and a passion and love uh, for the sport of football. That's sometimes part of the narrative. All African countries, well, they're, they're a little bit more familiar with, with soccer or football than baseball or basketball, so it's part of the narrative, but it's not really a main part of it. Unfortunately, it was raining that day, so I didn't get the clearest shot. Impressive movie theaters now. Now, these are movie theaters that are often frequented by non-natives. Right? This is in an area called Victoria Island, which is, Lagos is a very big city. It's where you fly into when you go to Nigeria. It's not the capital of the country. But it's, for all intents and purposes, the business capital, certainly the capital of the film industry. Uh, and you'd fly in there. It's very big and sectioned off in many different sections. Some sections, they tell you, you know, specifically on the government websites when you travel to Nigeria, don't go into this section, don't go into this section. You're better off going to these other sections. I went to all the different sections, met some people in, in you know, directors in some places, people told me not to go. Uh, it, was, it wasn't as you know, frightening as, as people make it out to be. But this is in a nicer area, these Silverbird Cinemas. And that one of those I was passing around was played at a Silverbird Cinema. So the bigger directors uh, that actually do have their films shown on theaters that don't go straight to video would prefer to show it in a, in a place like this. But who is the audience is still a question. You do get local Nigerians that would go, but mainly this is in Victoria Island and this is where 
mainly inhabited by Europeans and some South Americans as well. Mainly there for oil. Right? <clears throat> Products that they consume and produce, like star beer, all right, and large buildings. It's just a lack of images of the city period that you see in favor of the uncivilized rural images of villages. Not that those don't exist, but now this I don't think you'll be able to read it, and I hoped. I did a screenshot. Elegant dining. Alright? And this was a Nigerian who basically was my best friend there, took me around. His name is Sanctus Okareke, but Chris Sanctus is what he goes by, and his comment was good. Good picks, Mike. I can see that you are a good Nigerian advocate. People who need to know things about this country should meet you. This is not to toot my horn. It's meaning to say that you know, not, not what they read on papers or watch on their TV. Uh, basically, that these images need to be shown in, social, in any form of media. They just need to be part of the narrative. That this, this was one of the most beautiful restaurants and places I've ever been in my life. And you'll see the view. And the next shot, it's absolutely gorgeous. A 12th floor restaurant view. There's a lot of construction going on. So not everything is you know, looking perfectly pristine, but it's a beautiful, beautiful area. It has nice beaches, you know, this is not, and this is some place that is a tourist spot for locals, <coughs> more so. People who live in Lagos would come to this part of the island to experience uh, you know, just a, a short vacation. But at the same time, the workers are talking about inequities and things like that that do exist. Now, these are, these are things that would be experienced not by every Nigerian, but they're primarily, you know, set up this part of the city for, for tourists. For, but the workers at that 12th floor um, elegant dining shop that I had would travel sometimes three hours by bus uh, stopping probably you know, 20, 20, 25 times on the way to pick other people up to get to work at 8 a.m., leave work at 8 p.m., get home at 11 o'clock at night, and had to live very difficult lives uh, and for very, very little money. Didn't get many tips. And the inequities were never more frustrating when the owner of that whole hotel came upstairs one day had a dinner for, basically rented out the whole restaurant, had a dinner for about 100 people. None of them paid. None of them tipped. That's what, that was the instruction was, when the owner of the hotel comes in, basically the people who come and work for nothing, literally work for nothing that day. They don't get any tips. The owners, the, the inequity was, you know, ex very, ex ex extremely angry. Um, but yet these workers were still uh, coming to work every day and doing, you know, extremely, extremely hard jobs. Familiar hotel rooms. Right? It's not to say that every place I stayed looked like this. Not at all. Uh, some places were very sort of, you know, African-themed hotel rooms, and plenty of places I stayed were not hotel rooms at all. Uh, didn't have a running shower like uh, you, you would see if you went into that hallway and took a right. Didn't have a nice safe and things like that, where, but where places where the electricity went out six, seven times a day. Right. Uh, there was no running shower, as I mentioned. You're, just, you're showering with a you know, bucket and some soap and just pouring it over your head with a ladle. So you have that, that level of inequity. Uh, but these things do exist there. This is not a place, Nigeria is not a place the government encourages you to visit in terms of tourism. Nice homes and cars. And this would be a shot almost directly out of the opening credit sequence of a good 800 Nollywood films, so Nigerian films. <clears throat> you have nice you know, Mercedes and BMW satellite dishes and a very nice home. Uh, my friend, my friend uh, had just moved into this home from a much, much smaller place. Uh, but it wasn't fully furnished or anything like that. And most of the rooms were, were empty. Uh, and he was just, you know, working on furnishing this place. But he was someone who was middle class, hardworking, a very, you know, entrepreneur who did work in production of PSAs and radio and TV and film. And he also worked on the side for an organization that was 
patients, you know, giving HIV and AIDS supplies around to his local community. Uh, and he was also, as you'll see, an Igbo chief. And I mentioned to you house up before. <coughs> so here <coughs> you have, but also the inequities. So a lot of those familiar things, things that they would never be part of the discussion of what Nigeria is like. But you also have this. I mean, this is part of the discussion of what Nigeria is like. You see extreme poverty. I mean, this is from a highway. This, this was like a mile deep, uh, almost. Or at, le at least that, you know, a mile or so to there. Just, uh, you know, shanty town, shacks everywhere, highly polluted, uh, unsafe by all accounts of, of everyone I talk to there. Unless you live there, you don't really venture into that area. And unfortunately, this you know, is, is part of the real life experience there, but it consumes the, the discussions and the news and the films and <coughs> basically the beliefs of, of people in the United States that this is what Nigeria, the most you know, profitable, most populous, and the country with the most Emigrants that now live in the United States of all African countries that this is all the country had to offer And it's just so so far from the truth It's one little section of one little area of Lagos, but there's so so much more to be shown and discussed right? but other than the city that I just showed you there is some you know village roads uh, and When it rained believe me, you're not you're not getting through this uh, without you know, a large vehicle, you know, some sort of Jeep where you're walking in a huge puddle. But these types of things were part of the actual experience. Ceremonial landmarks, and this is something that they had there for over a century. Um, and it was basically just a, a long spear that they'll take and they'll have <coughs> as part of an annual ceremony. Uh, where they're praising gods, various gods, and you know, wishing uh, that the next year be healthy, wish for a good harvest, etc. So the sort of, you know, people would consider that to be the primitive, uncivilized, local religions, uh, but they are still you know, very much present. But they're present alongside of, and I will go back to other other religion, other religious presences. You had this Christian church within a mile of that, of that ceremonial sphere. <clears throat> but that was present. And then this is an Igbo tribal village meeting that my friend was uh, a member of their consultory board. <clears throat> he and he were the leaders. Of this of this group, and this is my friend here. See, he was also part of the board. Uh, but they had a discussion for about an hour and a half about what best to do with the money that they have in the village in terms of education. Should we fix this? But there was really like a sort of town selectman meeting, but one that was only you know <clears throat> only attended by Igbo of the Igbo eth ethnicity. So I mentioned houses in the north. The south of Nigeria is mainly split between Yoruba and Igbo, all right? And they have long-standing dislikes for one another, like many <clears throat> inter-ethnic strife across Africa, across many other places. They approach film production very differently, all right? All three ethnicities approach film production very, very differently. And I'll, I'll go into that slightly. Uh, but basically, what all the films often deal with is the conflict that, it, that one has in terms of identity, living in a world where you have all these overlaid religious beliefs. Uh, you have a heavy Islamic uh, presence, certainly in the north, but everywhere. A heavy Igbo, Yoruba, and Hausa presence. And you also have a, a pretty heavy Christian presence. So all those things, you know, woven over each other, uh, you know, potentially affecting one's identity depending on what their family, what their friends, what their you know, uh, wife or a significant other feels. All those things are constantly 
in conflict. And a lot of the films do deal with that uh, in very serious ways, whether they're entertainment films or not. Now, Igbo films, and these are the, sort of the stereotypes, Igbo films are mainly in English. Right? Igbo is a language, sometimes spelled I-B-O, and there's no G, so the G is silent here. But <clears throat> they're made in English. So initially, Igbo were thought to be the smartest businessmen and entrepreneurs of the film industry, and that they made their films in English because it would get a larger audience. Right? Everyone can speak English. Nigeria was you know, colonized by Britain and didn't get independence until 1960, so they had a large English-speaking population. So Igbo businessmen would make their films geared towards the largest population, and they wouldn't use Igbo language, they wouldn't use subtitles, and it would be mainly uh, you know, dramatic entertainment genre films, uh, sort of like war films, films about relationships, romantic comedies, etc. A lot modeled after the genres in Hollywood. Yoruba was all about preserving their own culture. Uh, the director that I talked to most, unfortunately, I, I don't think I have any pictures of him with me today, but uh, I, I believe he's the most well-respected, <clears throat> longest running director in their country, going for almost 24 years, 25 years now. He's uh, Yoruba, and all his films are in Yoruba language, about preserving Yoruba customs, uh, going to sacred Yoruba places, and uh, he's very much invested in keeping that, that culture alive, his fear that the younger generation is not practicing it, and they want to just become sort of more uh, homogenized, some Americanized, some just a general sort of African homogenization, rather than strictly Yoruba maybe just more of a Nigerian uh, association. So Igbo and a house of films were mainly geared towards uh, Indian traditions. So you had a lot of singing and dancing like Bollywood. So three completely different forms of, of film production are in this country. And they're making up the largest uh, certainly, you know, film industry across Africa, but the largest non-India, non-U.S. film industry uh, that's ever existed, just you know, pumping out films. Um, and who is watching them is the question. Nobody in the film studies world, uh, still in a lot of in a lot of circles, believes that they're worthy of being watched. I disagree. I disagree completely. I think there's, there's a lot of value to be learned about other cultures and about filmmaking processes in, in different countries by looking at these films and studying how they were made, why they were made, and for whom they were made. And they're very, very important. But the Christian presence is, is felt largely in a lot of those films. You can see in one of the covers there of the Holocaust, you have a is a character who's a priest. It causes a lot of battle between <clears throat> between religions and that. And, uh, but some of the films are just wildly entertaining and, and comedic. Uh, and that approach to life is never shown. Uh, that sort of you know, the larger narrative of Africa and Nigeria doesn't include that. Going back. So there's one, what time is it? I think that you should answer that question. <laughs> think about what groups are stereotyped. If you have any questions about <clears throat> Nigeria or that film industry, I'd you know, be happy to field those. But what, what groups are stereotyped in, in Thai film and TV? And the same question for you, Ling Li, and Chinese film and TV, and and then within within Saudi culture as well, Saeed. In, in my country, in, uh, uh, I think that uh, phenomenon stopped last year because in China uh, the TV shows dramas we don't we don't break it, so everybody can watch it. But if but we have a, a government department is called broadcasting and TV. Uh, 
general bureau of things like that. They control the holdings. And if the so in my country uh here in the broadcasting, the content in the broadcasting and the TV or movie, they should not uh, against the main theme of the government or the Communist Party they set. They set the main theme. So the sex, uh, a lot of things they think is outrageous. Is it, 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 you don't you think about it. Them. You could not make a movie. Even you make that movie, is you don't have opportunity to show show around it to public it. So in that case, um, some directors find a good topic, which the bureau would not cancel it. That is the war. Uh, theme uh, drama is against the Japanese war. So a uh, lot of ridiculous dramas uh, appeared at that time, at least five years. We had all kinds of ridiculous dramas. It's so funny because a lot of audience, they, they were educated that Japanese is the biggest enemy of China. They invaded China. They killed a lot of innocent person. They raped a lot of women or things like that. And but nobody told them that the truth is the Chinese traitor, the number of the Chinese traitor is uh, three or four or five times much more than the Japanese soldiers. They helped the Japanese soldiers. They did the horrible things together with the Japanese soldiers. But nobody <coughs> mentioned that. They just uh, caused the stereotype about the Japanese soldier like they are little, they're not big size, they're small size the guy and with a, 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 a beard just like a, a black point here and <laughs> with that, that the, the, the color big screen or yellow color uh, uh, uniform and they, they just stubborn just say hi and uh, if they fail, they're easy to commit to suicide and use the knife to cut their stomach from the one side to the other, to the other side and uh, the other thing is great. Uh, I, I watched an interview of a Japanese actor. He said it's really, he, he, he could do nothing about that because once he was uh, in a scenario that he was an uh, officer and a lot, uh, just uh, followed with some Japanese soldiers, they would walk through a village and suddenly they found a Chinese girl and it was very cold, a lot of snow, and it's in the uh, um, outside, not inside. It's very cold, and the director just said, the Japanese soldier, uh, when they met uh, the Chinese woman, the first thing they did were rape, very her. But the, the Japanese actor says, even in Chinese, there is an old saying, a man, only when he feels uh, full in his stomach and he feels warm, he will think about to have sex with a woman or things like that. But nobody could imagine that it's, it's cold, it's outside, and I'm, I'm walking and just suddenly I just want to rape a woman. It's so ridiculous, but the directors asked me to do that. And, and in that case, the audience, they feel angry, and but they're still interested to such kinds of TV dramas. But they're angry, they just... Um, they are easy to excite it to say, I have a war with Japanese and eliminate the country from the world. They are so evil, they will go, things like that. And at last, nobody could stop this ridiculous uh, current. So finally, the Bureau said, uh, no more Japanese war drama. <laughs> Just like a year ago? <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, almost the last year. Because at, at last, there's it's not about the soldier and uh, it's not about the war. Uh, I, I can tell you a very ridiculous story. It's really funny. Uh, a Chinese woman with good uh, martial art and she was surrounded by uh, like a dozen to twenty Japanese soldiers and also the Chinese traitor soldiers. Uh, at, at the beginning, she begged, let me go, uh, don't hurt me, uh, let me go, just let me go. I won't against the Japanese or things like that. And at the last, she was getting raped, and then the ridiculous scenario started. Um, the woman was laying on the floor, and her pants was under her knees, and suddenly she jumped up, and the knees automatically up to her waist, and she used her martial art to kill all the Japanese and the Chinese traitors uh, with the arrow, no gun. But all the Japanese soldiers, they have gun, they have a lot of, uh, of the arms. So all the audience said, that is too much far from 
the it is not real. It's, it's, we, we don't know how to find a word to describe such kinds of dramas. We, just, um, we could not let the children to watch, watch them. It's really bad. And uh, my mother-in-law told my son, because my son go to, uh, went to the international school in China, and my mother-in-law told my son, said, uh, try your best not to play with a Japanese uh, a classmate. I said, you could not talk to him like that. Even even Japanese themselves, they're the biggest victim in the war. Because until now, there's still the Japanese citizens suffered from the leukemia caused by the auto bomb. Actually, uh, no matter Chinese and Japanese, not everybody are so inter interested to get involved in the war. Some of them, they are forced to go to the war. Some of them, they are just the student from the school and immediately were forced to go to the war. You should devote yourself for the country, uh, for the uh, for, uh, to um, save all the people in the East Asia or things like that, with that kind of excuse, the Chinese people, some of them, they, they had the same experience, they were forced. So uh, I just told my mother, well, you, you could not ask my son to do such kind of things. Uh, Japanese, not every Japanese is bad guys, and Chinese is as well. So it's only about personality. I never thought. Uh, a person can stand for his or her nationality or ethnicity. It's only for himself or for self personality. So I said, Japanese they have good people and uh, they have very nice people, but Chinese they also have very evil, bad guys. So I don't think I, I don't know why the government um, allow and encourage that kind of topic of uh, the media product to show to. To this citizen, to the people. Yes, I, we still have the not very good relation with Japan, but I think it still should to be realistic and objective. Could not fool the people like that. It, it reminds me just like uh, last semester I learned the uh, agenda setting. I think this is a kind of agenda yeah. setting. The government support, then the, they allowed this kind of stupid director to co produce such kinds of rubbish uh, media media product yeah. to fool the people. And the government has a lot of power to set the agenda yeah. in, a, in a place like China where they have so much control over Yeah, uh, the in media. my country, they, they don't know how to rule. I think the, the biggest problem is sometimes they don't know how to rule the country. They just let it uh, develop without any guidance and restrictions when it go to a ridiculous uh, um, level, they stop, stop everything. Just like our stock market, <laughs> lots of things is like this. They just uh, stop. Okay, we can do it again, or we can eliminate, eliminate it. Just like this, it's not reasonable. So, but but stopping the Japanese war dramas is one one positive thing yeah. potentially, or not? Do you think? I mean, yeah. it seems like they've been pretty harmful. If, you know, mother-in-laws and everyone is, is endorsing that type of anti-Japanese sentiment. Yeah. From, but it's very, that's very fascinating. And certainly that would have been one group I may, I may would have guessed that were discriminated against in, in Chinese media would be Japanese. Yeah, my mother-in-law, because she, she's almost 80s, when she was a little girl, uh, her relatives, her friends were killed or hurt by right. Japanese, that's true. But it's hard to it, it not shake means those that my, my son's classmate, Japanese classmate, is also as evil as their an ancestors. It, it's different, right? Because their parents just do the business in China. I don't think they're they're bad. But why? Beca just only because uh, he or she is Japanese. He don't talk to him. Don't talk. Don't play with him. I think that is unfair and it's stupid. It and is unfair. Yeah, it, it, it's really not good. <laughs> it is unfair. Are, do they represent um, Thai culture in any specific way in Chinese media? Thai, we have a lot of movies, two kinds. One kind is about the, uh, some, uh, I don't know what kind of word I should use. Jenny, the, the snake Jenny, some, I, I watched the movie, it's about a cobra snake. Uh, she was saved by a young, beautiful woman, and that, and then she, the, the, the snake, not she, it fell in love with that woman. Uh, so uh, it was jealous about, because that woman fell in love
involved with a man who had a husband, uh, who had a wife. So from then on, the corporal tried its best to kill that man. It, a lot of Thai movies like that. Another kind is about the Thai martial art. The, the, the Muay Thai. Yeah. Muay Thai. It, it, it's masculine uh, movies. But I, I went to Thailand twice. I, I think the the people, most of them, I met, are very nice. They're polite, and they always give you a very warm smile. I think it's because they have the uh, religious. They, they believe in Buddha, so everybody is very nice. Not like my country, uh, we don't have a, a official or majority religions. So, um, like my father, they're communist comrades, so they believe the communist. But I, I found a lot of so-called communists when they went to the temple. They pray very sincerely. They pray for uh, high positions, more money, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not allowed. Actually, a communist should not have the religious belief. Right. But a lot of people they go to the temple. They believe a lot of things like this. They pray a lot. So it means I think actually they don't believe their belief. Their communist belief. They they join the party just for the promotion for. Um, but it's the party in power, so yeah. in a lot of ways, it's you don't have a choice sometimes. Yeah, well, when, when I was work for my uh, my previous job was I work for a state-owned company. Uh, my my boss persuaded me several times, asked me to join the party. I said, I know nothing about that party. I don't want to join it. And he said, once you join it, you will know a lot. Um, it, but if you are not the party member, you have no opportunity to get promote and. It, it's impossible for you to join the senior management. I said, I'm okay with that. I, I don't want to do it <laughs> because I, I, I don't believe it. I think sometimes it's against my human nature. Yeah. Because in China, most the the leader, the Chinese um, communist party members, uh, they they are so called. They devote themselves to the party, to the country, but they sacrifice their time with their family. They said this, this is their only force because they could not uh, do the, uh, the two jobs at the same time very well. The one job is work for the party, devote for the uh, people, for the country. Another is to be a good son, good husband, good father. Uh, they sacrifice the family part. But I think as a human being, we have families, so that is our human nature. The first thing is we should take care of our own family and then the job, the career. But they just cut the, yeah. yeah. They they prefer to choose the other part. So I, I don't like that. I'm a woman. I just want to have more time with my son, with my families. So uh, I I don't want to work overtime uh, just for some dining and drinking, just to uh, try to get more opportunities to promote. Even that, I I will sacrifice my health and my family. I, I don't like that. So that's why finally I quit my job <laughs> and came to work. Well, you're certainly putting your experience to good use, though. And you will in the capstone, I know, too. <clears throat> what about you, Chula, right? Yes. Yeah, so, um, what stereotypes within Thai culture do you see? Um, in, in my country, we, like, um, as I would say about the film, like she said, most of Thai films, they, um, yeah, we, we, uh, they were under government. They uh, they have rules and they um, like not uh, the the movie should not against the government should uh, and should not say or anything that um, that uh, effect or impact to Thai royal and also to every religious in there like um, we even uh, right. Right now, and I think it's it's been like ten years or more than ten years that um, south south part of Thailand they have uh, a war between religious like Islamic and um, and Buddhist and also Christian. But um, Thai movie or Thai or Thai video or or uh, any educational or enter for entertainment that they not something like they they will say that it's They're not wanting to see, to see it too. So that's, that, that's interesting. So that I mean, it could be in a sense 
a, a, ni a nice gesture by the government, perhaps, to not want to offend, but in some ways, if the government is in charge of producing these films, they're just going to want to make the film that's the least offensive to the largest amount of people in order to get as many people possible to watch. So it's all essentially about money in the end, and that, that would be an initiative that would just be meant to not offend anyone, so it can be, you know, a, a, the most wide group of people would see it, so you won't offend any particular religion. Most of them, and it's a smart business move. But most of them go with like entertainment, yeah. with uh, Thai history, with uh, romantic drama, something, something in general. And uh, if the movie will like, um, how can I say, a Thai movie, they um, when like for romantic scenes, they're not. I mean, I mean, the actor and the actress not kissing each other. They just use something. That not not doing it for real. That that was the thing they they really uh, specific and they will have like um, before before the movie showing they will have the like the content showing it that this this movie is for people um, eighteen plus or something. Mature audience. Yeah. yeah. Well, they don't want to encourage any behavior like yeah. that amongst the youth. But it's not 100% worse, because no, um, yeah, there will be <laughs> a way to. Of course not. Yeah. Very good. And Saeed, what, what do you see? What <coughs> sort of <coughs> cultural stereotypes exist within Saudi Arabia? Yeah, I believe that in Saudi Arabia, everything is uh, controlled by, by the government. So we don't have like, more entertainment, maybe like, some film. Like, also, unfortunately, we don't have theater. We don't go to see the movies. Or no theaters? Yeah, no theaters at all. And uh, I can say the internet also controlled by the government. Yeah. Uh, for example. Um, so, stereotypical material then taken off of the internet? Yeah. yeah. But they, they like control everything. You can't like to just search for many things. Nowadays, like, they control uh, like what's up. Which is in the app, you can download it and you can call your friend or family for free now. But they can't, like, you can't do any calls from here to several through this app. Mm. So we have like top. Yeah. I mean, I, when I think of government owned media, I, yeah. I think that they would disallow anti government messages, but I didn't necessarily would go the next step to think that they're going to disal disallow anti any group messages. Yeah. Uh, which is, but that's very interesting. And again, I think it ties back to a business aspect of not wanting to offend anyone, make something more homogenized, and then you won't accentuate or highlight the possible conflict between groups. Can I ask you, so do you have, do you have Saudi productions? Like, are there uh, films that are produced in Saudi Arabia? Yeah, but you have to ask to, to get permission from the government. Right. When you do like film. Or I don't see a whole lot of Saudi movies. Yeah, so that's why we can like but, but in those films, who do they who do they make fun of or who do they vilify? Who, who's the enemy in those films? Like I said, they control everything. Is so the anti American yeah. sentiment? Yeah. Uh -huh. so you have no choice there. Yeah, so so the government controls the content, but yeah. then it's a, it's a story, right? It's a movie. Yeah. So, so the mov movie is telling a story about. Usually, the story there's like a hero and there's a villain. Okay. Who's the villain? Uh, I don't see the name. So usually there's a hero and there's like a good guy and a bad guy. Okay. Who's the bad guy? on the story, you know? Yeah, so yeah. what are a few examples of I potential bad guys, I guess? I'm not a like, lover, like a like, film lover, so I don't watch like many, many films or something like that. So. Okay. No. It's not, a, I mean, when I study films from around the world, Saudi Arabia is never really discussed. 
feel like there's no historical Saudi Arabian film that's put into the major meta narrative of film history. It's, uh, there are, you know, films from Ira Iran, 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 Egypt, mm, sure. and other places that have you know, well-known film industries, but not not Saudi Arabia for yeah. such a big country too. Sure, so. yeah. I feel like there's someone in there that's waiting to make an unbelievable movie. But but is it focus and entertainment is on television? Television shows? Yeah, some some channel. You have some entertainment channel you yeah. can watch. Yeah. But I, 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 all I can say they control everything. Yeah. Like the internet. Yeah. So and as a result of that, does it make you less willing or less to, you desire to watch it less because of that fact? I think it would have that effect on me too. They're lucky. They, uh, anyway, they, they can they can use Facebook and, and Twitter. In yes. my country, we don't have that. Right. But we have the similar Chinese uh, me, media, uh, the the app, the social media app. But uh, if somebody posts a, a Twitter or a news says something bad about the government, if this is uh, this post was re reposted more than five hundred times, the original poster. We'll be arrested. <laughs> so you don't have any Facebook? We, we don't have, but we have a, 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 a something called WeChat. That is similar, that. like, it is a combination of Twitter and Instagram. We, we can post uh, pictures and we can uh, communicate with our friends. That is WeChat. Another one is a blog. It's just like Facebook, just like that. But nothing, if uh, there is something against the government or, or refer to some sensitive topics, that uh, the this blog, the blogger will be muzzled. Yeah. He or she could not post anything. <laughs> Just like <laughs> so. Yeah. And that would that would uh, deter me from posting something. <laughs> so time to go. Yeah. Well, I was gonna wrap up discussion. I mean, we <coughs> talked about stereotypes and examples of them quite a bit and I hope that you enjoyed some of my stories about Nigeria and some of the images of things that actually were encountered there and in comparison to the you know, scary world that the media here paints Africa as and Nigeria as. It was a very rich discussion. Yeah. Thank you. It was wealthy. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank Bye you Thank you for your interesting input.